we don't want added pressure on these kids to have more homework to do. They're, these these girls work so hard in school already and do yeah. so well usually. So we these are just little assignments. So like the first assignment is pick 10 schools to target after we've gone over, okay, here's your start values. Here's what division one coaches are gonna want. So, and here's when you're graduating. So we talk about the timing and we explain all that. So, you know, most of them have never really thought about it. They just wanna get recruited. Welcome to another episode of Heated Conversations. I am your host, Peter St. Pierre. Thank you for tuning in to another episode. On the podcast, we have a new guest. You know, the podcast has been centered around college process a lot of times in a lot of the episodes. And today we have JH Consulting, Jill Hicks with us to kind of talk about some of the ins and out of the process and what kind of questions you should be asking, things you should be looking for, even steps to take. Because I know those are hard things to really understand or know what to do and how to really reach these coaches or get in contact or even put yourself in front of them. So super excited that she joined the podcast today. Let's welcome Jill. today. I'm good. Thanks for having me. I'm excited that you're doing this podcast. I think, you know, um, parents and athletes all over. That's one of the things I think um, my, I do a podcast too, and I hear it all the time that they love, you know, just hopping on these informative uh, podcasts because they don't have a lot of extra time. So I think they really enjoy learning from um, people who have resources like this. So I'm so glad you're doing it. It's great. Yeah. And it's an honor to be able to give back to gymnastics, a sport that really has given me the life that I have. Mm -hmm. I wasn't a gymnast myself in 2009. I had an opportunity to start coaching at my local high school and it's taken me on this journey where I've traveled the country and and being able to meet a lot of cool people. And I think in that process, I've been able to connect with, you know, college coaches and make these relationships as well as, you know, coach a lot of athletes and hear their stories and listen to parents kind of talk about the process of recruiting and to get more understanding. And for me to be able to find a way to give back, you know, similar to you. Mm -hmm. Now, before we kind of get into all that, I have a couple of questions for you. And these are questions that I ask all my guests, at least recently I've been asking all my guests. And so the first question is, if you could have anybody cook you a meal, who would you have cook you that meal? And what would you request of them to make you? Oh my gosh. Well, definitely Italian food is my favorite. <laughs> um, I would probably have a girlfriend, one of my girlfriends, um, because... There's just something different when girls are together with girls, just hanging out, having dinner together. So I'd probably pick my good friend, Mary, and we'd probably have Italian food and the conversation would definitely not be lacking. Lots of laughter, but also deep, you know, that's one of the fun things about getting together with your girlfriends, girl to girl, just the things you share and you know, I've known her since the day I stepped on Oregon State's campus to be, a, you know, a student athlete on a scholarship there. We didn't know each other. So we've been friends for life. And I just love those times with my um, my good friends. I mean, I love my husband and I love having dinner with him, but I don't know. Those are such special times with people who've been your lifelong friends like that. And I think that's really awesome, especially as we talk about more in the podcast with the college and what college can bring in, in that process, it's pretty cool that you have a friend that you met when you're a student athlete that you are still friends to this day. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we interact with people for a season and that's all that we do. And it's mm -hmm. cool when it extends beyond that, because I think that's the important thing about sports is that it ex it's, it's an extension of where you can reach in life. You know, certain things that you do will put you in certain places and sports will give you an opportunity to be able to reach other places that you may not have without it. 
And so I think, you know, with that question, I love it because I like to know sometimes what people are interested in and the type of relationships that are close to them. Because I think it tells a lot about a, a person mm-hmm. that, you know, community is a big deal to them as well as relationships is a big deal with them. And everybody can relate to food and relationships in some some sort of Uh, capacity. And so Mm -hmm. that's why I like to intro with that one. Now, my second question, if you could see anyone live in concert, dead Mm -hmm. or alive, who would you go see? And who would you take with Mm -hmm. you as your concert buddy? Yeah, well, this is an easy one. In fact, um, we just had friends over for dinner a couple nights ago, and we pulled um, out this guitar when I saw your guitar hanging there, I was thinking of it. Um, and it's in a case and it's BB Kings. Um, it's a signed guitar. And, um, that was my dad's favorite. And we lost my dad three years ago at Christmas time. And this was one of the things that we inherited. So, um, he loved BB King and I take my dad with me and we would have a blast and, he used to always, whenever that music would play in his, uh, in his truck, I was always, you know, it was just embedded in me as a little girl. And then through all the years of my life, how much he loved that music. And so I loved it too. So that'd be what I do. I love that blues yeah. music with his guitar, just ripping uh, away. Yeah. <laughs> No, I, I I love it. As you see, as you can see, I have my guitar over here and I really enjoy music and music is something, again, that really connects people. And I love that you said, you know, to kind of remember your father and, yeah, you know, as you're kind of talking about the time frame, you know, Christmas time, and I'm guessing, and I could be wrong, that it was around COVID time and hopefully it wasn't necessarily related to that. But, you know, as we have we're on the end of holiday season, it can make Mm -hmm. it hard, right? For families, especially if you lost someone who's so close to you around Mm -hmm. the time of the holidays and you're going through the holidays without them. But the way you are describing it is as if it's a good memory, you know? Mm -hmm. And to be able to tell people that, even though the pain of them not being here, it is Mm -hmm. felt, but also the memories that you can have because of things like that guitar that you guys inherited and the music that he loved. And you can think about, you know, things that you did together, things that you would have done together. Right. Yeah. You know, my dad's probably one of the most significant people who impacted my athletic career. Um, And so, you know, I miss him. There's days where it's really hard and it's so deep and you, it's unbelievable almost when you um, have those days where you can't even believe they're gone, you know, but my dad really taught us that every day you wake up, you have opportunity and he taught us to be positive. He taught us to work really hard. And so I feel like he's with me every day. You know, I feel like there's no way I would have gotten through the years of being a young athlete, the years of being in college, the good days, the bad days when I was coaching for 20 years, and then starting my business, JH Consulting, you know, he was an entrepreneur himself. And so there's so much that I take with him all the time. I think about him, you know, things that, especially on the hard days, I feel like my dad just really taught us as kids that, you know, there's, he, he used to wear that shirt, never a bad day because he lived it. You know, he lived out, um, when things were hard, he used to always say 80% of what you worry about almost never happens. So why dwell in that darkness and that frustration of things that come your way that are hard, but instead focus on the 20% that you can see as positive right now. And probably what you're worrying about won't even come to fruition. So I feel like it's made me uh, live life uh, every day. I enjoy, I will love waking up and focusing on the next challenge. And of course, as an athlete, you have to have that mentality so often, 
and there's so much out of your control, you know? Yeah. So my dad definitely had a huge impact. And so I, I carry with him so much positive, uh, with me today because of it. So. No, I love it. And can you talk about your, how he impacted you as an athlete going all the way back to when you started, uh, doing sports and were you a gymnast yourself and kind of talk about your journey as a gymnast, um, leading you all the way to Oregon state. Yeah. It's so clear to me that it was meant to be my life and the path that I'm on now. My mom laughs. She's still alive. And she always says, who would have thought, oh my gosh, all those years that you were a gymnast would have turned into your whole career, your whole life, you know? Um, But it started, I didn't start gymnastics till I was 12. I just, we moved to a new city. My mom said, why don't you go take a class at the high school where you're going to go someday at this new area? and meet some kids. So I took uh, a gymnastics class. I remember jumping on a trampoline. So maybe it was even just trampoline, but the instructor happened to be an Olympian. He, he was an Olympic gymnast himself in the past. So I kind of moved really fast with him that summer through all the different things he taught me. And I had never done gymnastics before. And then he said to my mom, why don't you have her try out for a club? And So I was 12 years old. So anyway, I ended up uh, that year at just a regular club down the road, but um, all the kids were going to go try out at a club where a lot of Olympians were. So I just went and watched because I didn't know what I was doing. I was so new to it. And they had all been in the sport since they were little. And I thought I went to the tryout thing and it, um, like I said, had a ton of Olympians on it, had the Olympic coach, you know, so I told my mom, I think I could try out and do it. So I got to go to the tryouts the next day by myself and ended up, they handpicked five of us. I was one of them. And so I was elite by the time I was in two years, um, having tried out at that team. So then, um, so six hours a day, six days a week and intense these, Mm -hmm. this coach handpicked us and all we did was work on shaping for a whole year we didn't get to touch the equipment much you know he knew what he was doing and he wanted to take us he wanted our body positions and technique to be um so that when he did have us on the equipment and we did start to compete that we it would be you know a lot easier for us so we all made elite really fast and so I competed elite for most of my career um, you know, the biggest meet I was in was championships the USA and with all the Olympians and it was amazing. I did get injured in that meet and I learned so much through that moment. Cause prior to that, everything I was in, I would win because that of that body shaping and the technique and what a, you know, amazing technician he was our coach. We also had an Olympic, um, ballet coach an hour a day, you know, so it was intense, <laughs> And I pretty much loved it until I didn't. And then I got like into my, almost my senior year of high school. And I was like, wow, my whole life was gymnastics really from 12 until then. So even though a lot of kids would say, well, that's not very long, you know, cause you weren't in it at the, eight. most girls are in it at two, you know? So then um, college, I didn't know anything about college gymnastics. And back then there really wasn't a whole lot going on but I was from California. So UCLA had a team in USC um, and they started recruiting us because we were the elites, you know, in California. And um, so I ended up at Oregon state on a scholarship and um, my injury that I had gotten my senior year was uh, need, my needed needed to be kind of reconstructed. And by then I was like, I am not going through a big surgery. I am kind of burned out because of that intensity. So the, I went in and quit the team. I didn't tell my parents and I loved the college, the whole college thing. Like I loved being on a team. I loved my teammates. None of that was a problem. I think I was just, um, I had never had a break. You know, the intensity of my club experience was so high. So the coach said, how about if you stay on your scholarship and be one of our coaches? And I was like, coaching 
I had a little coaching experience when I was in club and they actually fired me because I was so bored and I didn't like it. So I was thinking, no way do I want to be a coach. But I thought, well, why not? I'll try it. You know, I love my friends on the team. So I coached my peers and became one of the coaches. And then um, that turned into a 20 year experience. And then I became a head coach. I became a true assistant at Oregon State for 14 years. And we took the team from nothing to um, top four in the country. And I had a lot of All-Americans and national champions on beam and floor. Those were the two events I coached the most, obviously. And then I learned to choreograph. And so I did a lot of the recruiting at my last few years there. I was pretty much in charge of that. So I learned a lot and I absolutely loved it. Then I became a head coach at Cal State Fullerton and my husband's also a college coach, head coach of wrestling. He was a two-time national champion at Oregon State. So that's um, our alma maters. And um, we both became head coaches at the same time um, or pretty much at the same time at Cal State Fullerton. So we were in a situation where they were only going to keep the programs for one more year because we weren't in the conference of the university and they kept it much longer. We raised thousands of dollars. And um, so that was an experience that I'd never done before. And then um, they did end up dropping our programs. So we were like, OK, what are we going to do now? And we decided to move back to Oregon where our kids were. And where we wanted to live, there's no college gymnastics for either of us. So he started a sports psychology. Uh, he had his counseling degree all those years and kept it up. So he opened a practice. So he does uh, family and sports and athletes and counseling. And then I started JH Consulting. At the same time, I got asked to go on tour with the Olympic team. So in 2012, after the Olympics, I got on a bus. I was the chaperone for the Fierce Five for four months. And um, so that was amazing. And at that time, I kind of created JH Consulting and started it. I thought it would just be something I do on the side for fun, where I would help families in the recruiting process. Um, but we've grown to now we have seven advisors and we've placed thousands and thousands of girls and boys. Also, um, we have multiple sports. Uh, the bulk of our sports are um, gymna gymnasts. But um, yeah, so it's evolved into this business and that I'm doing. And I absolutely love helping parents. I love helping the athlete. And um, there just it was a real need for it. There's a real niche. And as far as JH Consulting goes, it's different than a lot of companies out there. I wanted it to be different. Having been a college coach and elite gymnast myself, I knew that it needed a personal touch. It needed a one-on-one -on -one and not just the big send your profile to us and we'll help you get recruited because I really feel like especially gymnasts and myself, we are very typically... Uh, been a little sheltered and don't really have the skills. We've never worked before. Usually um, we've never had to answer to questions that we just go to the gym, give us an assignment, we'll do it. And then we'll compete, you know, but when you go through the recruiting process, it's much different than that. And I think being a recruiting coordinator and a head coach, what I saw were families would walk in my office and they really didn't know what they were doing. They really didn't have a lot of experience like you and I just talked about earlier. Um, so, you know, we have three children ourselves who went through the process in different sports than gymnastics or wrestling, which my husband coached. And what I really learned through all of that, that kids and families really, um, if they've never been an athlete themselves and it evolves and changes every single year, the rules change, you know, the sports change. Um, they're really at a disservice and fortunately there's so many good colleges out there that the, you know, it's not like there's all these bad ones and then there's all these good ones. But what my hope is that we really help athletes to have a voice and to be responsible for their own recruiting so that when they step into college, they actually, um, feel like they've earned it. They've worked for it in the, not just the physical, but also 
in the relationships that they're building with these coaches as they go through the recruiting process and their teams. And they're looking at all aspects of what they want out of college. And so when they get there, they feel an ownership. And then they're going to step into the team with a lot more leadership, I think. They're going to have a voice. They're going to have a better experience, hopefully, because what we do at JH Consulting is we meet one-on-one -on -one for, for sometimes two years, and we're really pouring into them way more than just what college do you want to go to? You know, we're trying to help them te uh, learn um, how to be leaders, like I said, how to know what they really want out of college, their education, um, the relationships they want to build, um, you know, where they want to live, and of course their majors. So there's so much more that I felt I could do with this business and helping families and kids so that hopefully they have an experience like I did at Oregon State, where, you know, their teammates are their lifelong friends. And they, you, you know, you can't predict how it's all going to go physically or what events you're going to make or if a college coach is going to leave or stay. But there are so many foundational things that they can establish in the high school years, I think, with our advisors and really grow as a person um, that really impact their experience once they get there. And I appreciate you going on that journey with us, taking us from the beginning and mm -hmm. talking about your personal story and even some of the things that could give credibility through this process, because I think that's one thing a lot of people are looking for is credibility sometimes to either feel like it's worthwhile going through certain process or even listening or even listening to this podcast, what credibility is there and having someone who's gone through it themselves, who's gone through it at a high level, who's been on the side of also coaching it and recruiting these athletes, being a parent as well, who's gone through it, you have a full perspective, right? Yeah. And that I think helps a lot of people to be like, okay, I feel comfortable doing this. Now, not to kind of play devil's advocate, being a coach and, you know, I've heard this from other coaches, how is the relationship with your, your, your consulting and coaches? Because sometimes mm -hmm. coaches want to have that in their hand and be the ones to help the athletes through that process and build those relationships with their, with the colleges and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, can you kind of talk about how you bridge that gap with coaches or even support the coaches in what they're doing with their athletes. Oh my goodness. Yes. When I first started, because the college coaches, you know, I'd been in the sport for almost 30 years as an athlete. And then as a coach, you know, the last thing I wanted to do was be a company where college coaches would be like, what is she doing? You know, like, you know, we knew Jill as, you know, a coach all those years. And then now she's doing this. Why is she doing this? You know, like, She's kind of stepping on our territory, you know, so I was very, um, I would say, aware of learning from them too, like what, how I could enhance um, what they're already doing and not get in their way or, you know, call them and say, you should recruit this person, you know, and bug them. What happened because of that, and I think Fortunately, my, I would guess the years of experience that I have, and a lot of these coaches have known me for now 40 years, it's a small world for me because those coaches I've known for so long, and um, I believe they respect what we do at JH Consulting, so they pick up the, they pick up the phone, you know, yeah. and we don't call them unless the athlete has done the work, so, um, or I, I really... And it, it doesn't need to be a long conversation because they already know that the athletes done the, done the work that we've taught them to do. So we have a, we have great relationships and I try to hire other advisors who are like-minded that way, who I know I can trust, who aren't going to be bothering, you know, college coaches, but instead the foundation of JH Consulting is that we wouldn't even have to do that because we've built into our athletes who are going through the process um, the, the fact that they need to be doing their recruiting. They need to be connecting with the college coach. 
In fact, I know as a recruiter, it's a red flag if anyone else is doing it more than the athlete. So that's how the premise and the foundation of the business is built. So yes, there are times where I see an athlete come along and I'm like, whoa, I think they'd be a great fit for this coach or this program, but I'm not going to call the coach initially and tell them I'm going to wait. I'm going to get to know my client, get to know the parents, get to know possibly even the club coach. I'm going to watch that athlete, see if they follow through with our assignments. We give them a little bit of homework. You know, I want to know that they're committed to this, that they're going to, they're going to be an athlete I can recommend to a coach, you know, because that's our reputation too. So there's so many things that have benefited JH Consulting um, to me, having been, like you said, a coach, having been an elite athlete. I have a lot of elite gymnasts too now. And a lot of people do hire us in confidence. They don't want, you know, college coaches even knowing, or we have to get permission to even speak because there's NCAA rules I have to be, we all have to be aware of. Um, but also some, some families are are afraid to tell their club coaches and that's okay. Like I tell them no problem. We don't even need to ever, you know, what we are going to pour into your athlete and you as a parent, as far as knowledge goes, can just be between us. No one ever has to know. We don't even ever have to say you are a JH girl. I don't care about any of that in the end. Yeah. It builds my business and reputation. And, you know, of course there, we love it, but only if the athlete and parent are comfortable. So, you know, that's, those are the kind of things and how this company has been built that I think has made it so strong and that so many families do come to us. Um, and it comes from having been, you know, in the trenches, being a college coach myself and, you know, um, being an elite gymnast myself. So, um, you know, I never felt like I, when I coached honest truth, I never noticed my paychecks. I always just deposited them or whatever. I loved caring about people, mm -hmm. caring about the girls, caring, getting to know their families through the recruiting process. Um, I don't know. It's just how I'm wired. So JH consulting, I run it the same way. I knew when I got the idea that I thought there was a potential, it was going to be something families would really love, but I didn't know for sure. You know, I'd never been a business person. Um, so I had started from nothing, really zero, ground zero, you know, and we have thousands of kids now, you know, that have come through and families. And I've never felt like I'm competing with anyone. I've never felt like um, I have to do this or I have to do that. I just, I think when you put people first and you care about them now, it's not always going to work out for every family, but that's right. okay. Right. You know, I can't control all that, yep. but I think families feel like they're cared for yeah. and the outcome, um, isn't as important as it is that we're treating them you know, with, with really, really good quality goodness, um, as they walk through the process, because the process is really hard, as you know, and you yeah. probably being a coach. Yeah, um, no, it is. And being able to really connect with, because for the most part, as a club coach, you have that relationship already established, but mm -hmm. sometimes you may not have the other end established. You may not have the college, um, coach, a relationship established. And so that could be difficult. And, and even with the landscape of how things change and with just the nature of sports in general, um, there can be turnover, especially at the college level where someone goes to a new place or here and there. And you may start the process where, for example, you know, I might have started at University of Minnesota. I'm from Minnesota. And, yeah. you know, and with a certain coach and say that, excuse me, say that coach retires or for some reason that coach moves on to another university. Now 
going through that process with someone new, right? It can change so much of if I'm still interested in that program. But also my club coaches may have had a relationship with that current head coach at Minnesota. And when they left, you know, they might have gone to a university that may be out of my level of really where I could really compete and do well. Right. Mm -hmm. And so Minnesota, that caliber of a program might still be where I should go. And so now having to, you know, start that process almost yet again with someone new and figure out, Hey, is that person a good fit? Or does my coach even know that person, you know, mm -hmm. and then going in and be like, all right, Hey, you know, the previous staff was recruiting this and this. And sometimes a lot of times there's no obligations unless they've signed for that new staff to keep that athlete. Right. Right. And so, you know, having people who are in like you are and have had so much experience and relationships with so many of these coaches and stuff like that can make it a lot easier. And I think, you know, trying to educate club coaches about kind of what you guys are doing and what the steps are because I think some club coaches could be eerie just because oh, you yeah. know how you mentioned with the college coaches almost kind of you know stepping on their toes and feeling like you are or even you know we'll kind of talk about the assignments part that you're talking about you know mm -hmm. giving them things to do which and I don't, I don't know at this point what they may do, but again, if someone else is telling my athlete what they're supposed to be doing when I'm the one who's with them all the time, who yes. knows them is hard, right? Yes. And so I want to kind of go down that. So what is, what does it look like when you got, when you start with an athlete, what is the process that you go through and how do you make it their own recruiting? So we start with a get to know you session and that's what we call it. So it takes about an hour. We just have questions about their background, gymnastics, academics, desires for college. Um, and then from there, we look at their um, videos and evaluate. And then we talk to them about the overview of the recruiting process. And so we talk about how many schools have gymnastics, what's the difference between division one, two, and three, what are the NCA rules and regulations that they need to be aware of? Not all of them, but you know, just some, some of the basics. And then what is what does it take to get recruited to division one, two, and three? And so we break that down. And then we look at their routines and say, okay, your start values for college are different than your start values for level 10. So what's the difference? Because there are different rules and most kids do not know what that is. They think they're at a 10-0 start value and they're not. And so we gently explain all that. And most of the time families leave that session and go, oh my gosh, we had absolutely no idea. And so and what I see with, I would say 90% of the clubs, they actually love JH Consulting because once they learn about it, if they don't know about it, because they don't have time for this. I mean, they, they barely have time to walk in the gym prepare the assignments, get those kids to level 10 and do all the things that it takes to travel and, you know, meet the needs of the families. So most cl club coaches who, um, or maybe have no experience themselves are relieved when families hire us. And I think it's because we aren't pushy. We always respect the coaches. We always say, okay, if that's what your club coach wants. Then that's what we're going to do. You know, like I know how important that is. The, the last thing we want to do is put more pressure on an athlete when they walk in their club and feel like, oh my gosh, Jill said to do this, but my club coach said to do that in recruiting, you know, and we're really careful. We don't tell them what skills to, to choose or, you know, we're not there to coach them. We're not there that way. We're careful. I'm smart enough to know, you know, respect those club coaches. They're the ones in the in the trenches at the time with those athletes and those yeah. parents. So, so our PDFs that we give at our assignments, they're only a 30 minute session after that, get to know you once a month. So they're very quick. We don't want added pressure on these kids to have more homework to do there. These these girls work so hard in school already and do yeah. so well, usually. So we these are just little assignments. 
So like the first assignment is pick 10 schools to target after we've gone over, okay, here's your start values. Here's what division one coaches are going to want. So, and here's when you're graduating. So we talk about the timing and we explain all that. So, you know, most of them have never really thought about it. They just want to get recruited. They've seen Utah on TV. They've seen Georgia. They've seen LSU. They've gone to some big camps, but they don't really get how to get there. And they don't really get that maybe they're never going to have those skills. You know, they hope they will. Um, but most kids don't understand. And then they understand and they feel so much relief. It's like, okay, let's focus on my schools. What are what are going to be my schools, you know? And they get excited about it. So we map it out. We put it on a map. We talk about the weather. We talk about, you know, the size of campuses. We give them two schools they can reach for. And then we want eight realistic. So then we break it down. We get inside those schools. We do virtual tours. You know, there's so much more than, you know, a club coach has time for and that we hope we're taking off their plate, not making it worse for them. And then which camps do you go to? How do you talk to the coaches? Are you allowed to talk to them? You know, hopefully we're just making, we want to see it as a team effort. Right. So that's what we do. We have lots of fun PDFs how to talk on the phone. We have one called a phone call cheat sheet, you know, so they're not nervous. They have everything in front of them on this cheat sheet of what they want to say, questions they want to ask. Um, I think the challenge is when they're not getting responses, you yeah. know, and that's when we're really there to try to encourage them and really help them go, okay, maybe we need to open up and look at some other schools or, you know, I think if you just give your, uh, the other big problem I see is parents and coaches tell them to send their emails way too early. So they start sending their emails just because they're ninth grade, you know, but they're not even, they've never even been a level nine or a, a basic level 10 yet. And I know what that's like as a, as a college coach, getting all those level nine emails and you're like, you have to delete them or push them to the side. You're never probably going to look at them again, you know? So I tell families, hold on, let's wait till you're at their level or very close. Then we send it. That coach is going to keep it and go, we want to keep an eye on that girl. Mm -hmm. She's going to be at our level or she's at our level. We want to put her on our watch list. And then they go, oh, like they've never thought about it like that. They just don't want to be left behind. And I get that. You know, my own kids were in other sports and we had to learn how to do soccer uh, you know, basketball and, you know, it, it, it just, each sport is different yeah. in how the timing is, how they recruit. We had to hire help. My husband and I were, you know, high-end college coaches ourselves, but they're all the sports are different. So we hope we're bringing a lot of education to the table and that I believe knowledge is power in yeah. the recruiting process. And I think parents just feel responsible you know, they feel like they have to kind of be the advisor and they aren't advisors. They, they know they're not, you know, so that's what we do. You know, it's not meant for anything else than that. And there's no pressure. We hope we're taking pressure off Yeah, is what we're doing. So we, we have fun with it. We have a lot of fun at, at our sessions. And, you know, one of the big things we ask them in the get to know session is what are you good at besides gymnastics and school? Hmm. all kind of look at us like blank. And that's something that is a big problem because they need to have their self-worth, not just in their sport. You know, their sport is what they do. It's not who they are. So we have a whole session on that, you know, like you're a sister, you're a daughter, you like to bait and they light up, you know, but they've never really thought about it before. And they're like, well, how does that impact recruiting? And I know as a college coach, I want to know who you are as a person, because when you walk in that door and we have our first team meeting, I don't want you to sit there scared to death. I want you to bring all of you to our team because we need you as a person yeah. more than we need your athletics. Yes. If your athletics doesn't go right and you get an injury. What are you going to be like? Are you going to have a bad attitude? So a lot of the girls, when they're injured, they stop posting. They're like, I don't want the coaches to know. I'm like, no, no, no. I want to know a good coach wants to watch. How do you go through physical therapy? Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? How do you impact your teammates when you can't be out there competing? 
you know, so I teach my advisors all those things and say, this is who we're going to be about. We are not just about recruiting. You know, there's so much more to it. When a college coach, they want the person, you know, yeah. they know how impactful, you know, being a college coach, it's like, you know what, you could have all the skills in the world, but yeah. you are a bad seed on our team because you're selfish Yeah. You know? or you're, um, you're not focused on the team when things don't go your way. Right. Or when we don't pick you for the lineup, how are you going to act? That is way more impactful on a team. And they know they're going to ask the parent or they're going to ask the club coach and everybody's going to tell them all the good things, you know? So there's so much that we try to, you know, teach. Yeah. Yeah. I kind, of, kind of going backwards a little bit. What was the initial vision for it and how did that come? You were talking about you were the chaperone for the 2012 Olympic mm -hmm. team. And that's kind of when it was birth in those four months. Yeah. What was your thought process when you're going through it? You know, was it related to what was happening with them or was it related to your own personal journey as a head coach and being an assistant coach or even your own elite career and recruiting process? Oh my. So, you know, I was really sad when my coaching was over, you know, I knew we, we needed to move back to Oregon because we were in California and there were reasons why, but we needed to move back um, to California. So even on our drive back to Oregon, uh, I mean, we need to move back to Oregon where our kids were. And, um, one of our kids were struggling and we needed to be near that child. So even though they were in college, so we, um, we were interviewing even on the drive <laughs> back to, to, uh, start our lives over here and interviewing for college jobs, both my husband and I, and getting offers, you know, in the car. And so it was really hard. And um, then I got asked to go on tour. So I go on tour and I'm getting all these phone calls in the meantime from all these club kids who I knew because I had still connections with clubs. And these parents were like, can you help us in the recruiting process? You know, and I was helping people for free and I was just on tour and answering phone calls and doing all that. And I was like, oh my gosh. I wonder if I could make a business out of this because I love it, you know, and I, I still get to be a part of maybe a little bit of college and kids and, you know, lives. So that's how it, how it was. And of course, being on tour um, during that time, as you can imagine, it was tough. That Fierce Five group was going through a lot. And in fact, I was really connected to Larry Nassar because I was also in charge of, um, getting all the trainers for every stop. And there was 40 some stops. So him and I were doing all the doctors and the trainers and, you know, um, there was a lot. And I had coached um, Michaela Maroney and Kyla Ross in between my college jobs. Um, so they were on the tour. Um, there was just a lot going on yeah. in sport of gymnastics and I've always, um, you know, I had some rough experiences myself, um, being a gymnast and abuse. And so, you know, I still had such a heart for kids and right. especially gymnasts because, um, yeah, I could, I, I could write a book on the tour. Let's yeah. put it that way. Yeah. There's a lot going on and the sport was really evolving and, you know, um, so I just, you know, I think I just felt, I didn't know where JH consulting was going to go. I honestly thought if I had five families that I could help, <laughs> I would do it, you know, and it just took off really. And, um, so, so the, here we are today and there are all aspects that I'm involved with. I, you can only imagine, you know, the kind of uh, questions we get and things we do to help kids that maybe never go on to do college athletics that hopefully, you know, I can be here for them too. Um, yeah. yeah. And what are the top three questions you hear that these athletes are asking or parents? And then what are the top three questions that are not commonly asked that should always be asked? 
Okay. The first one is, is my daughter going to be good enough? You know, cause we, we have a program called bright futures where families can hire us when they're in middle school. And when I first started the business, actually recruiting was happening in eighth grade for those top kids, right? So then it got pushed and the NCA changed the rules and now they can't talk to them till after their sophomore year. So that changed our whole um, business plan. So, um, so the first question um, we were getting was, is my, is my daughter gonna be good enough? And then the second one is usually which schools should we target? Are we targeting the right schools? And then the last one is usually parents say to me, um, you know, uh, we don't know what we're doing and we feel so responsible. And our, our daughter has done this since second, since she was two years old. So we, we don't want to let her down and try to help her and then realize we don't know what we're doing. And she's worked this hard all these years. So those are the three categories or things that I hear families kind of bring up in in the very beginning. So when should when should they start? And um, most people get this all confused. Of course, they hear from their friends and they hear from their club coaches. You know, yeah. send your stuff, send your stuff when you're, you know, in ninth grade. Or obviously, you would think that you're you you know right. you would think ninth grade right high school. Well. Um, after we evaluate all those areas um, in that first get to know you session, then we decide and we help the families know, okay, this is when we think you should start sending your emails. Um, but we need a few more sessions to get to know you and all of that. And then we come up with a plan, an action plan on the timing. And we tell them, we want you to send it when the coach is going to receive it and keep it not put you to the side or delete you. And I feel so bad saying that sometimes because I don't think kids think they'll ever get deleted. They just think if mm -hmm. I send it, then I'm in, you know, I'm, I may not get picked, but I'm, I'm doing the right thing. Right. But I know as a college coach, that's not how it works, mm -hmm. you know? So once they get that information, most families will trust us. But there are a lot of families that just do their own thing, even though they meet with us every month, they're doing their own thing. They're sending it when they want. They're just afraid. They're full of fear, you know? And so they're, I don't know. They're just, and that's okay. We we work with them and that's okay. Yeah. Um. So the, then, so that's important. And then picking the 10 schools to target, you mm -hmm. know, we tell them this is going to evolve and change. Most of the time, these 10 you pick because they really want to pick. They really want to get focused on that, right? Yeah. Which is great. But most of the time that whole list changes, you know, and again, we don't want to make them feel bad, but it's just how recruiting works. Right. You can pick all you want, but they have to pick you, you right. know? So some kids. Yeah, bring in some life uh, lessons in those things. Life lesson right yes. there. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So. So we've learned a lot about that and we try to be nurturing at the same time and careful and we let them pick, you know, it's like we give them a range, but we let them pick their, their reach schools, you yes. know, yes. and then it's all about what summer camps they go to, because I'm telling you those, they only have two summers really to make a huge impact on recruiting mm. and summer camps are probably one of the number one ways to get recruited now because you're seen, they get to talk to you. You know, so how you represent yourself, what yep. you do at those camps. But I can tell you, 90% of the time, they pick the wrong camps. Mm -hmm. You know, they pick the glittery, you know, the, of course. I mean, I would have too, you know. Yep. And so we really say, that's okay. If you want to go to a big camp when you're young and you have time, go to it, go have fun, you know. And enjoy that. But if you don't have time, like we get a lot of kids their senior year, maybe their end of their junior year, they've tried recruiting on their own. They thought they knew what they were doing and then they're not getting recruited. So then they hire us and then we have to scramble, you know, thank goodness there's those fall clinics because those have, we get a lot of kids to the right clinics and get them recruited that way too. So there's a lot involved and um, I can see why it's so confusing. And I'm telling you every year it evolves and changes. We change our stuff every year and how we do it because the rules change or the coaching changes or the recruiting changes. You know, there's a lot involved. Um, 
So that's, those are probably the three top questions that we try to impact right away. And talking about change, there has been a huge change in college gymnastics with NIL. Have, oh, yeah. Has JH Consulting integrated NIL into what they are doing now to be able to help student athletes to either navigate that in conversations with coaches or even helping find opportunities if say they're a walk-on or even if they are a scholarship athlete to be able to have some take advantage of that opportunity great question um you know again my personality and style isn't to like jump all in once the nil was announced and you know figure it all out and make it a big deal because the bulk of our clients are not that not that girl they're not going to be that athlete or that girl probably and I wasn't even sure from what I was getting from the college coaches that they even understood it. They weren't even making it a big deal, you know, because they were still figuring it out for the sport of gymnastics and for the sport, uh, big picture. Okay. So I, I just figured then I'm going to watch, I'm going to sit back. I'm going to learn. I'm going to talk to college coaches. I'm going to observe and I'm going to watch. So then when we started getting a lot of elites, um, to, wanting help. I thought, okay, I really need to learn more. I'm still finding it's not like that important yet. It's not that in gymnastics. Yeah. Things are happening out there, you know, that are amazing. And that I agree and disagree with for sure. But 90% of our clients, it's not a topic doesn't need to be most of the programs are just trying to stay alive, honestly, and ha keep their 12 scholarships, you know, and those kind of things. So yes, um, some of the parents do ask questions, but I'm finding that on it. Okay. Bottom line is these elite gymnasts who are going to go to those big programs where NILs are a bigger deal. Um, they just want their girls to be in a safe place and they want them happy. They, we have come out of a really dark mm. period mm. and most of these families were either touched by it. They knew someone who went through it. It is just not on their radar that these, that their daughters are going to get all this stuff, money and NIL stuff. They, it's just not what they're focused on. I can tell you that. Um, does it, is it down the road going to have an impact? Probably. But what I'm finding is the bulk of them, no, probably not. But once they get there, the coaches will explain it. Or when they go on their recruiting trips, the coaches will explain because every school is a little different in how they're managing it even. But I'm not even hearing that there's a lot of like of those top schools that have you know, things going on that they're using it in the recruiting process. I mean, yeah, they're posting stuff, you know, and you see what's going on at some of these schools and you're like, wow, but the kids, I don't know. I feel like I'm really glad to see that most families are pretty grounded and they just want their kids to make a good choice and be happy and healthy and safe. Yeah. You know, so that's what I've seen. I I'm sure it'll evolve and change. No, I think that's good because, again, sometimes, could, especially as things like with technology is always updating, right? With that new iPhone, it's always updating. We feel like we always need the, the new thing and, the, right. you know, NIL being the new thing and could be something. But it's good to know, excuse me, <laughs> that people, um, it's not something to really be a, a huge focus, right? A, a huge pillar in the process. Um, but also as things evolve and it becomes a bigger thing um, that it gets, it, it becomes part of the process almost organically, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And yes. so um, I think that's that's important to really talk about too, because in how you mentioned even colleges, you know, not, really it's not really yet a big deal unless you're at some of those big schools like you mentioned with you know some of the elites who are going there but um which i think this will be a, another time if you would be willing to have a conversation about it kind of talk about you know the season of uh that we have kind of 
are trying to get out to get out of. And even the time, you know, when you're with the teams that, that four months and even how to help um, athletes be able to process that. Right. And even just to talk to coaches, because I think that's important too, is a lot of the times we are so we're trying to get a product out of these athletes. Right. And right. number one, it's a human that we're trying to get a product out of. We're not mm -hmm. trying to get a product to do certain things to make our our life easier, like this phone. I can get frustrated with this phone and toss it, and I know its feelings aren't going to be hurt, right? And But if I do that to an athlete, there there's different repercussions for it, right? And mm -hmm. being aware of that and having healthy conversations for both coaches, but also for athletes on how to navigate that and how to make it better, you know, because again, it's not like, um, it is where they were under situations or people that were really trying to get the most out of that athlete, you know, in regards to like, say elite, you know, I'm trying to get you on Olympic team or national team or whatever it is. And most of those are goals and knowing that the intensity, like you were in the gym 36 hours a week, right? right. That's a full-time job with benefits for, you know, an adult, right? To be in there to really pursue that. And I feel like gymnastics is one of those sports that takes so much time, you know, like you're in the gym to so much time where other sports you they have their season, then you can kind of be out of season and you can kind of choose. Okay. You can't really choose to go out of season in gymnastics and then jump back in and think, hey, you know, I'm ready to go. Like it, it's one of those that are year round, right? Right. And so understanding like, hey, how can we take the human and create this product while protecting the human in, in that process, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so I'd love to have that conversation, but- yeah. I was thinking about this when you were kind of talking, you're in a conference that is now going to, well, soon going to disintegrate in the PAC 12. Mm. Can you talk about your time in that, in the PAC 12 and even yeah. coaching with some other legendary coaches and having that community in that conference and things that you really remembered from? I know. Yeah. You know, when I got to Oregon State as an athlete on our, you know, student athlete on a scholarship, it was NA or NAI, AIAW, I think it was the conference. Then it quickly moved to the Pac 8 and then Pac 12. So I've really seen the, you know, evolve, evolvement of their conference at Oregon State University. So it's really sad to me what, what's happened to them. But at the same time, you have to take responsibility. I mean, there's reasons that it happened. I don't know. I always look at it and go, you know, when I got to Cal State Fullerton and they said we're going to drop the program and I had to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars. Oh, I'm not looking around going, feel sorry for me. And, you know, yeah, it was hard and all that. But somebody that it happened for a reason that they didn't get picked for the Big Ten or whatever. I I that's the way I look at everything. That's how my dad taught me. You know, it's like, okay, what did, what went wrong? Why did Oregon state? And I believe it's Washington state, you know, get left out. Um, I don't understand all of it. I've had conversations about it. I do know some of the inside stuff, but you know, you can't feel sorry. You got to figure it out. You got to figure out. So now the gymnastics program, I haven't talked to Tanya and Michael in detail about it yet, but you know, I can imagine if it was me and I was the head coach there, I'd be scrambling to figure out, okay, how am I going to make this program, even though we're not in a bigger conference, the best it can be so that we can still get to nationals and win championships. You know, that's what I, I, I would just find another way, you know, yeah. it's going to look different and I'd have to probably change my recruiting uh, because people are going to be, I mean, I already got that from some of my you know, athletes looking at those schools. So what's going to happen? You know, how will this impact, you know? So that's how I'm wired. Like yeah. I would just, how I would dig in and find a, find a way, you know, to still make the program as successful as I could just as a little coach there. But 
um, of a great program. I mean, they have such an established program. I have no doubt that they're going to do a great job and that they'll find a way and all of that. But it's really sad. I, I mean, it's sad right now because I don't know if they're in negotiation or something will change down the road. I will hope so, you know, and I don't know what it's going to look like. But to me, thinking about where where it went from competing with those you know, big schools to what they're going to be, my understanding is what they'll be competing, just especially football. You know, I can't imagine the impact it's going to have financially and on your recruiting and all those things. So it'll be something to watch because I watched the opposite happen where it built up to being a powerhouse, you know, Pac-12 to seems like almost going backwards, you know, yeah. to me. So I hope they have something in the works. I hope something is good will come from all this, but it's kind of sad because I don't know if it's, if it's coming, like you said, if it's coming down to money and TV, which brings in the money, you know, eventually that's not a good ending. <laughs> it's like, I don't know where, you know, Olympic sports are going to end up down the road due to that kind of style of um, future. I, 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 it worries me Yeah, you know, for smaller sports. So we'll see. And in wrapping up, do you have any like point of emphasis that you want to make sure that the listeners or even the viewers get out of our conversations and even just about what you guys are doing in with JH? consulting because you brought a lot of good points and I think you helped at least for me being a club coach now clear a lot of what at least for you guys what you guys are doing instead of being under the assumption because I'm not the one who would be actively pursuing you or hiring you to go through this process right mm -hmm. if I were to really want to know it's either I talk to you in, in a conversation or my athlete who might have hired you were to disclose that but again, you had mentioned that trying to make the athletes recruiting process their process, and that might not be something they may want to really share. And so yeah. what are some things that you want to kind of leave the viewers and, and listeners? The biggest thing I would like to share is in the midst of the craziness when you're a parent and you're, you know, you're paying the bills you're getting them to practice. You're com you have to be just as committed in the sport of gymnastics, especially as your athlete is. I mean, it it requires an intensity like no other. Many sports do. I mean, I I did it with my own kids. It's it's kind of a crazy time as a parent in your life, and recruiting can also, you can step into it with that same mentality. And I just recommend you step back as a club coach and as a parent. And we were all remind ourselves the mental health and the happiness of our, of the next generation or your own children is, has to be the number one priority. And so asking them, list, being a good listener with your kids, how are you doing? Not talking about their sport all the time, not talking about, you know, what happened in practice all the time, but just checking in with them, making sure they're okay, making sure that they are really doing this because they love it. And they still, and they're going to have bad days. They're going to have even months where they don't like it, you know, but checking in and being a good listener are two of the things that um, I talk to the parents a lot about and reminding them you know, I look at it now down the road. I mean, I have five grandkids and my own daughters are, you know, one got recruited to Stanford in soccer and the other one got recruited to smaller colleges, you know? And it's like, when I was in that period with them, I was just like, so excited and wanted to, you know, felt this pressure and like, you just feel so responsible as a parent and uh, the athlete feels it even more, you know, and our daughter quit the sport her senior year, having all these offers in soccer and then went back to it and absolutely loved it, you know, but we always told our kids since we were, my husband and I were division one athletes on scholarships that they didn't have to do that just because they're, we did. And so when the time came, when our daughter said, I don't think I want to do this. And you're like, 
you've got to be kidding me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like we've just put our whole, all our money, our lives into this dedication and you don't want to do this anymore. We had to bite the bullet and do what we said we'd always do. And that was put her as more important than the sport. And looking back now that she, my, you know, my daughters are married and they have their own kids and their families and seeing how they're raising those kids and the values and the life skills that hopefully, you know, were more important than their outcome of how they finished at a meet or a competition in soccer or whatever, you know, is what they're going to carry with them their whole life. And now they're pouring into their own kids, my grandchildren, you know, you have to step back in the intensity you have to and you have to remind yourself of you know what's most important is our kids mental health and the sports are what they do it's not who they are yeah um, it's so hard to do that right. and that's my encouragement you know and that's i think that's why i enjoy jh consulting so much is because yeah i get excited when you know, athletes get placed and maybe it's their dream school. Most of the time it's not most of the time, you know, it's hard to find, get to your dream school, but you know, just seeing them healthy and happy yeah, and, and resonating that information all the time in our sessions is so important. Well, thank you so much. It was such a pleasure for me to be able to have this conversation and to kind of really talk about areas that it is. I'd think about just myself, having my own family, being a coach, having my own things that I'm doing, this podcast, and even, you know, going through the whole process of recruiting with an athlete and how there's companies like yourself that are out there to really help support the families and these athletes to be able to get to the places that they want to get to, but also to do it with authenticity and to do it where you're thinking about the person first, rather than just what they say their goal is. And if we just focus on the goal and we remove the person, we can hurt them in that process or it can become selfish. And so I appreciate your perspective on all the different topics we talked about. And for anybody else who is interested uh, and want in more information, I'll make sure to link her website and her information in the description below. Thanks for tuning in. Yep. Remember to subscribe, to follow, leave a like and a comment. Your questions are going to help us be able to get deeper in these conversations. And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Heated Conversations.